Hello, and welcome to AI for a Mechanical Engineer. In the previous lecture, we've reviewed some basic concepts in linear algebra. Today, I'll be elaborating more on the transformation of vectors. And before I dive into the details of vector transformations, let's quickly review the concept of vectors. So a vector in real space can be seen as the following. where these are the orthonormal bases. So from a notation standpoint, this refers to a particular vector, and this represents an orthonormal basis. So in this example on the right, there technically should be these hat notations on top. And given this representation of a vector, we can write out x as the following. And in a 3D Euclidean space, these bases are typically chosen as the following. So the key takeaway here is that vectors are represented as a linear combination of each basis. So with this in mind, I'd like to talk about something called a transformation. So in terms of a system, we typically represent our inputs as x. And after this input goes through some transformation, we have our output, which is denoted as y. Now, this transformation in between, by principle, can be anything. However, in today's lecture, I'll be talking about linear transformations in particular. Now, the advantage of using linear transformations is that we can represent these transformations with a matrix. So whenever we have a linear transformation, we can interpret this as a matrix. Similarly, given a matrix, we can also interpret this as a linear transformation. So from now on, I'd like you to think about transformations in terms of matrices. So again, given a particular input, after we go through some transformation denoted by a matrix, we have our output that is linearly transformed. So why do we want to learn linear systems? In essence, linear systems simplify our work by providing a clear interpretable framework for solving problems, making predictions and understanding complex phenomena easier. Now the question is, how do we define linear systems? Now by definition, we have two major properties that a linear system has to satisfy. The first is superposition, which is another term to represent that the system is closed to additivity and homogeneity, which is another term to represent that the system is close to scaling. So in other words, a linear transformation can be seen as a function or mapping within the vector space that preserves addition and scalar multiplication. So first for superposition, again, this term represents that additivity is preserved. meaning that taking a transformation after adding two individual elements gives the same result as taking two separate transformations of each input and adding them up separately. So this expression represents superposition. And let me take a quick example. Let's say we have our transformation defined as the following and two example inputs. So to see if this transformation is linear, let's try adding both inputs and take the transformation. Now let's try taking the transformation of each input. And you can see that we end up with different results, implying that this transformation is not linear. However, if we take another example where the transformation is defined as the following, in this case, You can see that we end up with the same results, implying that this transformation is indeed linear. Now moving on to homogeneity. Again, this was the word to represent that the transformation was close to scaling operations. In essence, scaling a particular input and taking the transformation of that scaled input should yield the same result as scaling the transformed result, 
hence this expression here. And if we take the same example from the previous slide, let's say our scaling factor is 3 and input is 2. Now if we compare the scaled transformation and scaling the transformation, in which you can see that the results are not the same, implying that this transformation is not linear. Using the same example from the previous slide, you can, we can also show that this transformation is linear by definition of homogeneity. So to summarize, a system or a transformation is linear if it satisfies superposition and homogeneity at the same time. And here are some examples of linear or nonlinear transformations. So these are two examples that I've shown in the previous slides, but a few interesting transformations you'll see are that the derivative and the integral are both linear operations or transformations. Similarly, this does not satisfy the definition of a linear transformation. And you can show that this transformation is indeed nonlinear if we try using any of the definitions we've discussed in the previous slides. So the reason why we use linear transformations is because assuming that we know the two bases of a given vector, and at the same time we know what the transformation of each basis corresponds to, then for any given vector, we can find the linear transformation of that vector. So again, we represent a vector as a linear combination of the bases, where a1 and a2 are unique. And here, if we take the linear transformation, we can represent the transformed vector as the following. So to summarize, linear transformations make it a lot easier for us to interpret the results because all we need to do is to observe how the bases are linearly transformed. So now let's take a look at a couple example transformations. So first of all, I'd like to take a look at rotation operations. Is a rotation operation linear or not? And the short answer is yes, meaning that there exists a matrix M such that we can represent a rotated vector with a matrix. And because a rotation operation involves a particular angle, we represent the matrix itself as a function of theta. And I'm pretty sure you'll remember this form from other classes, but if we take a quick peek at what the answer is, a rotation matrix can be expressed as the following. Now let's see why this is the case. So let's start by looking at each basis separately. Starting with our first basis, you can see that this length is computed by cosine theta, and this length is computed as sine theta. Hence, the rotation operation with respect to our first basis can be represented as the following. Similarly, if we look at our second basis, this simply becomes minus sine theta, and this simply becomes cosine theta. As a result, we have this for the transformation of our second basis. So far, we've had a vector to represent the rotation of a given basis, or vector. So if we combine these two, we can represent the rotation itself in terms of a matrix with our bases combined. So stacking our bases together so that we can represent a matrix, we get the following. And here you can see that we have an identity matrix, implying that the rotation operation can be finally written as the following. So in the first example, we found the rotation matrix by looking at each basis independently. And by finding what the transformation of each basis corresponds to, we were able to construct the entire matrix. The next example is scaling. So let's say we have a given input vector and we want to stretch this vector by a certain factor. And because we're preserving the direction, you can see that we use a scalar value to represent the stretching operation. Now at first glance, this might not seem like a linear transformation since there is no matrix 
However, we can represent this scalar multiplication with an identity matrix, which preserves the fact that we're still representing the transformation with a matrix, hence implying that stretching or compressing a given vector is also a linear transformation. Now, in order to scale the elements separately, for example, if we want to stretch the x direction by a factor of a and the y direction with a factor of b, we can represent the corresponding transformation as the following. And again, we can find this transformation matrix by looking at each independent basis separately. So for example, starting with our first basis, you can find the first column of A as the following. For the second column, and combine these two to get our transformation matrix A. So based on the examples so far, we've learned how to construct a matrix that corresponds to this particular transformation. Now, the important thing that I'd like to emphasize is that I'd like you to have the intuition to be able to think about what the corresponding transformation is simply by looking at the transformation matrix. In other words, I want you to have the intuition to be able to see what transformation is being done simply by looking at the matrix. Now, the next example is projection. So again, the question is, is a projection operation linear? And by now, I'm pretty sure you've started to notice a pattern here. But again, the answer is yes. And I'll be showing why a projection operation is linear. So just like we did for the other examples, let's look at each independent basis separately. Starting with an example projection onto the x-axis, given a vector, the projected result will look something like this where the x component is preserved and our second component is eliminated. So if we look at each basis independently, for our first basis, the corresponding transformation simply becomes this. And for our second basis, we do not preserve any information. Hence, we represent this with zeros. And finally, we have this as our transformation matrix for the projection onto the x-axis. Now, if we're projecting onto another vector instead of a given axis, let's say we have this vector. In order to find the corresponding transformation matrix, we can start by looking at each basis independently. So for our first basis, you can see that this length becomes cosine theta. And if we want to know the length of this, components, you multiply cosine theta with a second cosine theta, which in turn gives us cosine squared theta. Similarly, if we want to get the height of this part, we simply multiply cosine theta with sine theta, which in turn gives us cosine theta multiplied with sine theta. And in turn, we found our transformation for our first basis. Now, if we look at our second basis, we can start by drawing our second basis here. And all we have to do is see what this and this corresponds to. So for the first case, in order to find this length, we simply have to take sine theta multiplied by cosine theta, which in turn gives us our first term here. And in order to get this part, we multiply sine theta with another sine theta, which in turn gives us sine squared theta. And just like we did for all of our other examples, if we combine these two parts, we end up with our transformation matrix or the projection onto a given vector defined as the following. Now there is another way to represent this projection onto a given vector represented as the following. However, before I talk about the details, let me quickly talk about multiple transformations. So let T1 be our first transformation represented by matrix M1 and T2 be our second transformation represented with matrix M2. Now the goal is to first do our transformation T1 followed by transformation T2. So if we graphically represent this, x, our given input, go, undergoes through some transformation t1 to yield y, 
and y goes through our second transformation to yield our final result z. Now we can start by writing out what y is, and y is our input multiplied with our first transformation matrix, and in turn z becomes y multiplied by our second transformation matrix, and because we defined y in the previous line, z can be finally represented as the following. And if we combine these two transformations, our final transformation or compound transformation can be represented as M2, M1. And the reason why we have this arrow here is because the transformations are conducted in this order, starting from the right to the left. So with this concept in mind, let's try revisiting this example where we had to define a projection onto a given vector. Now, viewing this transformation in terms of a compound transformation, let's start by rotating this axis by minus theta. And in turn, we end up with the simple example where our goal was to project onto the x-axis. So our first transformation can be seen as rotating by minus theta, followed by projecting onto the x-axis, and then finally we can rotate it back into the original coordinates. And because we know that our theta or our rotation matrix is cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta, sine theta. If we write out our individual terms, we end up with the following. And if we do the math, we end up with our final transformation matrix, which corresponds to the same result we've derived in the previous slide. So here, here are two different ways we can view a projection onto a given vector. And in the first example, we've looked at each individual basis separately. Whereas in the second example, we've looked at the projection operation in terms of multiple transformations. Moving on to Eigen analysis, this is actually one of the most important concepts in linear algebra. So for those of you who aren't familiar with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, eigenvalues and eigenvectors in short can be seen as the following. Given a matrix or a linear transformation, if we can find a scalar value and a vector, that ends up with the same result as multiplying that particular matrix with the same vector, then we can call this scalar value the eigenvalue and this vector the eigenvector. And from a geometric standpoint, we can see that stretching the eigenvector with the eigenvalue yields the same result as the linearly transformed eigenvector. So to summarize, our eigenvector V represents the directions that remain unchanged under linear transformation A, and our eigenvalue represents the factor by which the eigenvector is scaled. So again, if we revisit the example of linear transformation, this time, if each basis is given as the eigenvectors, then we can write the transformed results as the following, where each transformation is represented as our eigenvector scaled by the eigenvalues. And as a result, we can see that the bases remain unchanged under a linear transformation if v1 and v2 can each be seen as a basis and eigenvector. So for those of you who aren't familiar with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, let's quickly review how we can solve for eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So because we started from this definition, if we start by representing this term with an identity matrix, we can simplify the equation as the following. And if we group this left-hand side with our eigenvector, we end up with this final form. And because we want to solve for the value of lambda and v, we don't want any trivial case. So for example, if this is equal to 0, we have our first trivial case. At the same time, if we have this equal to 0, we have our second trivial case. The third trivial case is where this, the inverse of this entire term exists, which is a case we don't typically want. So if we summarize this, we want to find a case where the inverse of this entire term does not exist, in which we can represent by saying that the determinant 
of this term is equal to zero. And if we solve for this, we find our eigenvalues. And for each lambda, we solve to find our eigenvectors. So let's revisit some of the transformations from earlier on in terms of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So starting with the projection onto the x-axis, we've previously defined our transformation matrix as the following. Now if we solve for the eigenvalues, we end up with lambda is either equal to 0 or 1. So our first eigenvalue becomes 0, and the corresponding eigenvector becomes this following. Similarly, for our second eigenvalue, the eigenvector becomes the following. Now one thing I'd like to note here is that if you look at the transformation between x and y, you can see that the direction has changed, implying that x itself cannot be a candidate for an eigenvector. Next, if we look at the stretching transformation, where the transformation matrix is defined as the following. If you recall from our earlier examples, you can tell that this transformation matrix corresponds to a transformation where we stretch the x-axis by a factor of 2 and preserve the y-axis. And again, because we've changed directions, x also cannot be a candidate for an eigenvector. So just like we did for the previous example, if we find the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, we can represent this transformation as the following. And just like we did in the previous lecture, we don't have to always solve for the value of our eigenvalues or eigenvectors by hand every time. We can use Python to do this computation. And in order to do so, we first define our matrix and find our eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors simply by using NumPy's function mp.linearalgebra.eig to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. So this part finds all eigenvectors for all lambdas. And because we have multiple values, we sort them here by size. And if we print the results, we have the following. Now, let's take a look at a couple more examples. Starting with, the, starting with an eigen analysis of projection onto a given plane, let's say we want to find the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. If we choose an arbitrary x that is perpendicular to the plane, the projected result simply becomes 0, implying that our eigenvalue is 0. This time, let's say we're given a vector that is within the plane. For any vector that is within the plane, then the projected result of x corresponds to itself, implying that the eigenvalue is 1. And for the eigenvectors, all we have to do is simply choose independent bases. Now let's do a couple more exercises. So given this linear transformation, let's see what kind of transformation this corresponds to. So if we start with an input vector and take the transformation, our resulting output has the following form. And if we graphically represent this, you can see that this transformation corresponds to a mirroring operation with respect to the diagonal axis. So if we do an eigen analysis of this transformation, first of all, we want to know if x can be an eigenvector. The short answer is yes, and if the given vector is along the diagonal axis, the transformed result preserves direction, implying that x itself can be, a, can be the eigenvector with an eigenvalue of 1. Similarly, if we have a given vector that is perpendicular to the diagonal axis, we can regard x itself as an eigenvector with an eigenvalue of minus 1. And just like we did for the compound transformation case, we can also view this mirroring operation as a series of transformations. So starting with the rotation by minus 45 degrees, the resulting coordinate system looks like the following. 
And here we're simply mirroring along the x-axis, which corresponds to the following operation or the following matrix. And after we're done with our second operation, we have our final rotation where we rotate the axis, axes back to its original coordinates. Let's look at another example. Let's say the transformation matrix is given as the following. Now, what kind of linear transformation is this? Now, to give you a hint, if we graphically represent this, you can see that this transformation corresponds to an operation by rotating the original vector by 90 degrees. So revisiting our rotation matrix and substituting 90 degrees into the rotation matrix, we end up with the following result, which corresponds to our original transformation matrix. And just like we did for other examples, we can view this transformation in terms of multiple transformations. So we first flip this input vector with respect to the diagonal axis, and then we flip this with respect to the vertical axis. And writing this out, we have our first flip here with respect to the diagonal line and our second flipping operation where we flip it with respect to the vertical axis which in turn yields the final transformation matrix. Now the final example is the Eigen analysis of a rotation operation. So just like we did for all of our other transformations, we can look at a given rotation operation or transformation in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. However, if we try solving for the eigenvalues, you'll notice that we end up with complex numbers as our eigenvalues. So try to think what the physical meaning of this is. But for starters, as a hint, you can see this as a preservation of magnitude, but alteration of direction within the real space. Again, this is, this is an important and interesting property. However, for today, I'd like you to think about the different types of views that we can have on transformations in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in today's lecture, I've covered some important topics regarding vector transformations, uh, linear transformations in particular, and how we can view these transformations through Eigen analysis. This is the end of today's lecture, and thank you.